Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. At the end of the episode, I will read from Try Not to Die in the Wild West. Thank you to everyone that has left a review. Those are super awesome, incredibly helpful. Book is only 99 cents on Amazon worldwide so what are you waiting for there's like 30 ways to die you could die 30 different ways in the old west that's what everyone wants by the time you're watching this paperback may be out i love how it turned out and for the record i never would have written this book without john Polisano. i never would have written a western i appreciate what everyone says that they like my storytelling and everything else but john and i both did this this is his his imagination came up with this entire storyline i came in and adjusted things added some things took away some things he went back and he did his take on it that was cool it was a great experience i think readers are having a lot of fun with it so very cool i don't want to forget talking about that because all i want to talk about right now is jujitsu i would force myself to calm down and not talk about it but it is jujitsu that has put me in a great mood this week along with the trend of in the wild west coming out and reviews and all that stuff too. I have book six, Death Fest coming out. Death Fest, right there, it's looking good, almost healed. I'll be able to wear a short sleeve rash guard for jujitsu, which is awesome. Anyhow, that's coming out in a month, maybe six weeks from now. And then after that is Ghostland, which another reason I'm excited, I just gave Duncan the last three death scenes. So one of them was super disgusting. I was telling my daughter about on the way to school and but she wasn't phased by it. I asked her, I was like, hey, I was like, do you want to hear this? I was like, it's pretty disgusting. And she was okay with it. And she agreed it was pretty disgusting. I haven't heard Duncan's response, how he's going to react to it. But I'm thinking he will like it. I'm super excited about Ghostland. I can't wait to see what he does. I told him, this is just a sketch. Take what you like. Make it way better. Put it back into your character's voice. And I know he'll do that. And it's going to be pretty awesome the last two death scenes i was not sure on i took them to a certain point and just said i thought he should decide those especially the final one that should be a really cool one and again these are his characters so i always feel a little bit weird killing them off sorry i think he doesn't mind one bit oh another awesome thing that's happening narration for the trans die in the wild west is going on i just put that thing out two or three days later it's like 78 different auditions lots of them pretty good so i think i've narrowed it down to about 12 i'm gonna let it go a little bit longer give my favorites i'll narrow that down a little bit more i'll send it over to john i'll let him pick who it's gonna be or at least the top three i think that's what we did last time for the, the pandemic and then maybe you know together i'll run through my family he'll run it through his family and then we will pick our winner so i think that's cool again that's how i like to work this is our book so we should pick the narrator together. You know, same thing with Donna. She did the same thing with the trend of Diane Brightside. So no, this is not just me. It's not my storytelling. This is, you know, collaboration. Same thing with, you know, Anthony's book at Grandma's house. Would I have written it without him? He was the one who really encouraged me to do it. He thought it could be a lot of fun. He thought it was a series that people would enjoy. So yeah, thank you to Anthony too and Sage. He wrote that. That is Sage's World. That's probably the book I'm talking about trying not to die in the Wizard's Tower. Awesome story. That book is probably the one I had the least amount of influence on. The other awesome thing I got to do this week, and I'm in the process of doing, I'm sorry I'm slow, but I do have a lot going on, is awarding the prizes to the 99 Spotify winners. I already sent the grand prize winner his spotify gift card congrats to roger b and then i'm in the process i sent out the email to all the 99 audiobook winners and now i am sending them their codes for those spotify books hopefully they will dig them i also have to send out some audible books because i messed up when i said it was worldwide and i didn't check that the spotify codes were good worldwide but no big deal i am happy for that kind of exposure i'm just going to get them audible books as long as that works, I got to figure out how I'm going to do it, but I will make sure that I take care of them. I want them to hear these audio. I want them to hear it and hopefully like it. I want to tell their friends, I want to hear more. So that is the whole point. Okay. Another really cool thing that's happening is, and I might've mentioned this, but it's gone up a little bit in intensity. My wife, son, and daughter are all learning German. 
and not like we're going at a hardcore, but there are days where everyone's trying to outdo each other on Duolingo. So that's been fun. That is going to speed up my learning because we're going to be speaking it a lot more. That's definitely going to speed up my learning and make me feel that much more confident when I go to Germany. I'm already feeling super confident, but being in the German hall as an English speaking author and as an indie author, that's in my mind, it's pretty balls, but whatever, it's going to be super cool. My daughter says she definitely wants to go with me. So I am going to make that official. She will be my little assistant. So that's all fun. That's all good. That is definitely, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing, but honestly, not why I'm in a great mood or it's part of why I'm in a great mood, but really it's been, can't see behind me. I got the sign up for 10th planet Jiu Jitsu Whittier. That has been very cool. I was intimidated by starting to train again. You guys have heard me talk about it on here about my fear that if I do start training again, I'm just going to hurt myself and then I'm not going to be able to. So that's how I've been preparing for this for the last two or three years is the expectation like, oh, yeah, dude, don't get your hopes up. Yoga's cool. Lifting's cool. You can get enough doing that. You don't have to do jujitsu. You don't have, you know, if you can't get back on the mat, it's okay. But so I, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel Sunday. I went super chill. It was open mat. So I was able to work with my son first and that was cool. We wore the same wrist guard and all that. Very cute, fun, worked with my wife a little bit. And then I met a new guy, an awesome training partner. So that was really cool. Went back the next morning at 6 AM and it was pretty awesome. Exactly my speed. Mike Wilson is the owner of the gym. He's the black belt, the main instructor and it's awesome. I, I didn't know what kind of atmosphere the gym would have. Uh, we, I had a lot of talks with Mike, but I wasn't sure. You never know how a gym is going to be when it opens and what kind of people are going to be there. You know, the owner might be one way, but then you have other people running through it that are just going to be more aggressive and everything else. But I mean, I love the atmosphere they created, what he's done with the place. I think he's done an amazing job. I'm so happy to have my kids training there. So, and my wife, she's training as well. She's trained way more than me. I think she just did the last five days. So, and I was able to train with her and my daughter last night. We did the beginner's class. That was a lot of fun. So all of that's awesome. Being able to roll with my daughter again, that's super cool. Training with my wife, training with my son. Today, I watched my son train. I, he trained on Monday with Coach Art, Coach Model, and he wasn't sure how he was going to be with it either. I didn't know if he was going to like it, say he didn't like it. But he was smiling. He was happy. He loved the entire experience. As soon as we got out there, he's like, when do I go again? And I was like, well, the next class is probably Wednesday, but then Thursday you have volleyball. He's like, can we cancel volleyball? I was like, done. Cancel. I don't care if it's a little bit of money. That's so cool that he wants to do it. Olivia, I think she was a little intimidated by it too, because it's been so long, but she had a lot of fun too. My niece Bailey is training as well, which is awesome. She's a great partner for my wife and for other people there. She's talented, strong. So very cool to have that. It's definitely been an improvement in everyone's mood. So with all that going on too, yesterday was depressing. So I trained in the morning at 6 a.m. So that's going to be Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays for as long as my body can do it. It's pretty cool because as soon as I get out of there, it's just a great way to start the day. So I'm learning and meeting cool people. Everyone's friendly. Every, no one's trying to kill each other. We're all trying to learn. I'm having to relearn because I've forgotten so much. And that's, so I did Wednesday morning. That was awesome. Still all pumped about jujitsu. Then went back at night with the family, with my wife and daughter. But after I got home, I was like, well, this is all awesome. The three of us are practicing Duolingo in bed. Just had this awesome experience being able to train with my wife and daughter. Second workout of the day. I should be in a good mood. But man, whether it's my ego, well, yeah, I guess it was my ego. Just being embarrassed of that and knowing it was going to happen, but going from, you know, a decent level of jujitsu and being able to move and roll to, God damn, I can't even do these basic moves. I forgot all this shit. And worse than that was, watching and this used to happen to me all the time at the headquarters i don't know if it's just because i am not a good not a good visual learner I, I don't know what it is but i would watch the move being done watch the move being done watch the move being done my time for us to do it i'm like what did he show 
and then just have to try to feel it out. My wife was pointing out to me that because she was watching me struggle and she said, that's a move that you do all the time and you do it fast and you take people's backs. And, but because I was breaking it down, I just couldn't figure it out. And so that was super frustrating. I mean, I, it wasn't that big of a deal, but just the overall feeling like, man, it's going to be a long time. But I just kept re, you know, thinking about all the positives. And one of the awesome things is, okay, now I'm going to be learning from coach art and coach Mike. I'm going to be learning everything correctly. I'm going to relearn everything. Everything is going to be better. If I just simply do this training, I will get better. I will get the skills back and I'm going to have, and again, even if I blow out my knee or whatever happens and I can't train anymore, I'm still going to have a great time watching everyone train. I'm still going to be there trying to learn by watching and cheering them on. So it's incredible to see. And today my son had an incredible practice. He didn't want to go. He thought it was going to be a gi and he, he has it in his mind that he doesn't like the gi because he heard my wife and I say that way too many times. But we kept saying, dude, just go, just go, just go. You can at least watch. And he went and it was incredible. So watching him learn, learn respect. I love the way Coach Art teaches. I love how Mike teaches. So incredible instruction. If you guys want to check out 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu Whittier, definitely should. Highly recommend it. I will be there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't come down and kick my ass because that's one thing I am saying. I was like, I got to get rid of my ego if I'm going to make it on the mat. I swore to myself, I was like, from now on, I have to wear a knee brace. It's stupid for me not to wear them. So I'll start wearing those every time I train. And I'm going to be very careful with training partners. And if there are moves that I shouldn't do, I just need to say, hey, I better not do this one. I'll sit out or find another partner or whatever. So I just need to be smarter. I need to take care of myself because I do want to be on there. It is fun. I really enjoy it. You know what, guys? I was going to do episode three of the Wild West, but... I'm tired of talking. The food's here. I need to have dinner. Then I need to edit this. And then I need to get, write my newsletter because tomorrow morning when I normally would do all that stuff, I will be waking up at 5.30 to go train at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. So I'm going to leave you guys with a short story. We will do one from Untold Mayhem. I don't know what it is. It's going to be a surprise. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. And the narrator, whose name would be down below, is going to tell you the name of the story. So I don't have to. Remember to check out Trying to Stein the Wild West. Tell your friends. Thanks again for listening. I hope you have an incredible week and I will talk to you later. Peace. Numbered Days. I can't tell if it is day or night in this windowless room. I have no clue what time it is, but I've got a feeling the doctor will be coming back soon. There's nothing to look at but the thick gray foam that covers the ceiling and all four walls. I've already counted and cataloged every bump and ridge on the thin sheet of milky plastic that covers the overhead fluorescent. And there's the camera with the speaker below it. If I faced forward, I'd be looking right at it. Usually I just close my eyes. That way I don't have to look at anything, especially the counter. I don't like to look at the counter. I used to watch the IV drip, drip, drip its way into my arm. I'd look for bubbles. Hope one might find a way through the safety device and float its way into my brain. Painless. But watching the IV measured time. One bag was six hours, four bags a day, and it's not like I need any reminders when the day changes. The doctor always makes sure I know. I also stopped monitoring the IV because I don't need to see the leather band restraining my forearm to the metal chair. I can't even budge them. I gave up after three days. About the same time I went completely hoarse and stopped yelling. My arms, my chest, my waist, my legs, all strapped down, beginning to atrophy from inactivity. I'd been in one of these chairs before, although that one didn't have a hole cut in its bottom so I could relieve myself into a bucket. It was after my first DUI, or maybe my second, when I got belligerent. That one time was all it took. 
I learned my lesson. Never again did I spit on a cop. But this guy isn't a cop. He's not even a real doctor. He's a fucking dentist. I've only got three teeth left, along with twenty-nine holes, half of which must be infected. Twenty-nine teeth dissolved in that jar of cloudy acid on the counter. Nine of my fingers make up part of the jar's solution. Never again will they hold a brush, caress a breast, scratch an itch. They're gone for good. My right pointer finger is the last one I've got. All that's left of the other nine is the charred mess surrounding the burnt bone of my knuckles. Oh, God, how they hurt. I refuse to cry. No matter what he does to me, I will not cry. It's time. I hear him coming down the stairs. He has the same blank stare he's had the last nine times. It hurts to talk with my tongue so swollen, and he never answers me, but I have to try. Doc, Doc, will you talk to me? He's got his back to me, arranging his instruments on the counter. I'll give you anything you want. Please just stop this. I swear I'll never tell anyone. He keeps fiddling with his damned toys. Doc, stop this. He looks over his shoulder, stares at me as if I were scum. You don't even know my name. I didn't recognize him until the third day, but I leave that out when I say, I know who you are. Oh? Your wife died. It was an accident. You killed her. You should be in prison. It was a terrible mistake. I've learned. You were arrested twice in the last year, and you had another accident three weeks ago. You'll never learn. It will never happen again. I know it won't. Now open wide. The metallic contraption in his hands is like something out of a hardcore bondage video. It only hurts to fight it. Good. Nice and tight. I can't talk, the cold metal pressing against my volcanic gums. I know what he's going to do, but it doesn't help. These aren't the tools he uses in his real office. They're rusty and dirty and haven't been cleaned in the last ten days. They sit on the counter the blood and bacteria growing before my eyes. His favorite is the rusty exacto he twirls around in each abscess, but the corroded pair of pliers always comes first. The pain is intense, but even worse is the sound of my tooth slowly tearing from the gum, its roots stretching to the breaking point and finally snapping free. Two more pulls, and I'm toothless. He holds the jar in front of me and drops it in, another permanent piece of me dissolving in the acid. At first I didn't know why he was doing it. The teeth I tried writing off as some weird dentistry fixation, but now I know better. He's destroying my identifiable remains, making me disappear. I wish I could kick him, punch him, bite him, something, anything but I'm completely helpless. My mouth is a throbbing pit, my hands just as bad. The phantom itching in my missing fingers is always the worst when he picks up his foot-long shears, another relic from the garage. The dull blades had been stained green and brown from chopping branches and hedges. Now they're covered in shades of red, bright red from yesterday, a lighter red from the day before, a brownish red from the first week. I never know if he's going to make it a clean break, or if he's going to take his time, slowly snipping away at the flesh and playing with the bone. With this damn thing in my mouth, I can't even beg for him to do it quickly. All I can do is hope. The blade bites into the sides of my fingers just above my knuckle. Blood drips onto the armrest, and then onto the concrete floor. Finally, the fingers detached, and in the jar, flesh and bone dissolving. He grabs the butane torch and readies the flame. The first two seconds hurt like hell, and then the shock sets in. The smell of my flesh burning had me throwing up the first two days. 
Now I'm sort of used to it. It still makes me sick, but it bothers him too. He holds his hand over his nose and mouth while the flame's on me. No more teeth. No more fingers. My ten days are done. I still have my toes, tongue, ears. My manhood. I don't know if this is good or not, but he's taking stuff out of the room. Every other time, he left the equipment lying there in front of me. Now he's putting it outside the door. Out goes the torch, the pliers, the shears, even the jar and the IV stand. He pops the piece out of my mouth and readies a shiny syringe. The injection doesn't hurt, the cool fluid pushing into my vein. He places another syringe on the counter. This one has its cap on. I ask, what was that? He undoes my forearm straps, then releases the one around my shins. He grabs hold of the harness and gives it a hard jostle. You can undo these yourself. I hold up my hands, no fingers to flip him off. How? Do you even know why it's ten days? I can't stand it when he stares at me like this. Look at me. Why did I give you ten days? Talking isn't going to help. That's how long my wife was on life support before I told them to pull the plug. I'm sorry. I'm sure you're sorry I'm doing this to you, but that's it. You only care about yourself. That's not true. Well, we're about to see how much you do care for yourself. Very shortly, you're going to notice that it is becoming harder and harder to breathe. I can already see you're struggling a bit to get air. I am feeling a bit winded. My throat swollen, the airway seemingly smaller. My wife couldn't breathe without life support. Unlike her, you're getting a chance. See this syringe here? The stuff in there will counteract the injection I just gave you. It's hard to talk, but I managed to get out. Give it. Give it to yourself. You have a few minutes. He turns his back on me and closes the door, the click of the deadbolt sliding into place. There's no guarantee that he's telling the truth about the other syringe, but my throat's getting tighter, my time's running out. The chest harness has two push-button locks, one on each side of my hips. I can reach them, but have nothing with which to push them. My thumbs are the most prominent knuckles, and my best shot. He took my left thumb first, so it shouldn't be as raw and painful as the other. Pieces of charred flesh crack off on the hard plastic. Tears flow from my eyes, blood from my knuckle. God, it hurts, but I can't get full breaths anymore. I have to get free. The lock pops open, but the other side's worse, my right thumb having been cut off yesterday. I try my other knuckles, but they're too small and just as painful. Now my entire hand is a bloody mess. I keep trying with my thumb as I'm forced to sip air. The lock opens and my chest is free. The seatbelt is easy to open using my elbow. I'm lightheaded and almost sit back down, but I can't. I need that syringe. I try to grab it off the counter with both hands, but it slips between my knuckles. Using the bridge of each hand, I get the cap off, bending the needle in the process. Hopefully it will still work. I pick it up between the bridge of my left hand and the knuckles on my right. It slips, but I manage to jab it through my shirt and into my belly. My palm's on the plunger when the intercom goes on. I forgot to mention you need to get that into your vein. I pull it out and try to put it back on the counter, but it falls to the floor. I follow it, dropping to my knees, unable to continue standing even if I wanted. My throat is sealed off, no air getting through. Thirty or forty seconds is the most I've got left. I claw at my throat, want to tear a hole in it, but have no fingers to dig with. My mind's fuzzy, but I have an idea and lie on my side put my arm on the cold concrete next to the syringe. I line the needle with my vein. All I have to do is push it in. It's in. Just push the plunger. It's down all the way, but I don't feel anything. I still can't breathe. There's a crack down the side of the syringe. On the floor near my arm is a pool of clear fluid. I can't breathe. Can't move. Time's up.